Oh. First little table there is asking us to uh, to ex basically expand out what we have. So x plus one squared. We want to get it. We want to get that into what's called uh, the standard form. And I'm going to indicate here what the uh, what the final answer ought to look like. All right. So we should be looking at something that's in the form of a times x minus h squared plus k. All right, so that's ultimately what we're trying to get as a result. Uh, I think I can do without the calculator for now. Just clean it up. Uh, yeah, so our final answer, our final answer needs to look like that, right? So we're going to just kind of build into that. The distributed form is going to give us what's known as the general solution. All right, so I'll say general form. And the whole idea behind this is to see if we could determine if there's a relationship between those two forms, the, the general form and the standard form. All right, so we're going to write the factors. X plus 1 squared is actually already in factored form, just not written as separate factors, so that's what I'm going to do. I'll write it as X plus 1 times X plus 1. All right, when you distribute it out, you get X squared plus 2X plus one, all right? And so this is a key ingredient, but it doesn't necessarily seem like we're doing anything different from what we've been doing before. So we've just been practicing distributing and factoring. How is this any different? Well, what we're up against here is trying to make a determination of whether or not there are any patterns, all right? So to do that, I'm gonna tell you to keep an eye on the first and last terms as we go through this. That's not a highlighter. That's a highlighter. All right, so we'll hold off on the standard form for a second, and we'll just work through the remainder of the table. So we have x minus 3, x minus 3. We're going to have x plus 4, x plus 4. We're going to have x minus 20, x minus 20. And when we distribute, we're going to get x squared minus 6x plus 9, x squared plus 8x plus 16, x squared minus 40x plus 400. So in each case, I keep doing that, that's crazy. In each case, my last term is a what? What kind of number? Perfect square. Perfect square. All right. As it turns out, so is the first number. First and last terms are perfect squares. All right, first and last terms are perfect squares. That's great, because that's a predictable pattern, all right? And so that tells me that we could actually, if we needed to factor, we could actually go the other way pretty easily. All right, so I'll get to that in a minute, but that's what that second table is all about. And it's really the idea of getting from the expanded form to the factored form quickly and easily without having to make an X chart. So I did, it's still there, I think so, yeah. I did an example with the other class before where I created the X chart and we went through the whole process, but it simplifies down a whole lot nicer and easier uh, using the approach that we're about to get into. Uh, the standard form is really just modifying the original expression so that it follows this pattern, All right? So I'm looking at, and this is one part of the, the lesson where you might say, I, I don't see the point in doing that, but you'll just have to believe me that it's gonna be very valuable very quickly, all right? So 
I have an x plus 1 squared. Well, my binomial there in the form has an x minus h squared. So it's got an x minus something squared. Now, if that minus is going to become a plus, what kind of number should I be substituting in? A negative number, specifically a negative 1. All right. Now, that's actually directly equivalent to the x plus 1 squared. So that must mean that the a value is equal to 1. That leading coefficient didn't change anything. So it must be a 1. And also, that k value at the end also didn't change anything, so it's got to be a 0. All right. Now, this definitely seems like the definition of overcomplicating. Right? Like, if it looks like, bless you, I'm taking something that was relatively simple and making it a lot more complicated than it needs to be. The whole idea here, though, is that we can get some important characteristics out of this, specifically the H and K values. All right. The H and K values are really important values on the graph. I keep hitting the wrong function. These two numbers are incredibly important. All right. We're looking for, uh, it, I mean, without getting too far into the graphs, we're looking for uh, the graph of what's known as a parabola. A parabola is the graph of a quadratic. And when we do that, we would want to know the most important characteristics, which would be the x and y intercepts and also the turning point of that parabola. Because if it's a curve, it naturally turns around. We would want to know the location for which it turns around. By putting our expression in this form, we're able to identify very quickly and easily the location for which it turns, right? or the turning point. Okay. So, with that in mind, there isn't really much of an adjustment when it comes to different types of problems. Because I have x minus 3 squared. That would be the same as saying 1 times x. The minus is built into the formula. So one, min uh, 1 times x minus 3 squared plus 0. Again, those h and k values give us the turning point. What's that? Not always. We'll get to cases where they're not. Where do you get the zero? Zero is the fact that there's nothing added on to the x plus 1 squared. So if there was some other number added on to it, then we'd have to have an adjustment there. And you'll see. We'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Michael? Is the 3 coming from the 9? The 3 is coming from a couple of places. You could say it's coming from the 9, but I'm not even looking at that. I'm looking right back in the beginning here. We're just taking this and put it, putting it in that form. Okay. So x plus 4 squared. We have a coefficient of 1. We have x minus something. But that x minus something needs to turn into a x plus 4. So what's the something? Negative, Negative 4. And that would be equivalent to what we started with. So that k value must be a 0. All right. So what we're getting out of this is that the h value is the exact opposite of the sign in the, uh, in the given binomial. So x minus 20 squared plus 0 is what the last one would be. All right. Yeah, yeah sure. Now, going the other way, it's, it's really a whole lot easier because if we're taking note of the fact that these two first terms, again, I don't even know. These, you know what? I'm just going to get my highlighting out of the way immediately. The first and last terms are each perfect squares. So we're already in good shape. We can get it into the factored form and then, uh, by extension, the standard form. A uh, little typo here. This should be the general form.
the factored form is going to be the standard form. All right. So when I'm factoring this, it really is just a matter of taking the square root of the first and last terms. So I'll just do it off on the side here. You're taking the first term and the last term and finding their square roots. What's the square root of x squared? X. And what's the square root of 36? Six. Six. And then we're just gonna carry along whatever the sign was in the middle. All right, it was a positive, so that's gonna come along for the ride. And then it's just a matter of putting it in the standard form, which would be one times x minus the negative six squared plus zero. And again, it seems like we're overcomplicating things, but it's for a purpose. All right, again, off on the side. Square root of the first term, again, x. Yeah, Nico. Um, so, like, the negative 6 is just the opposite of the 6 squared? Exactly, exactly. Do we have to do it on the side, or can we just do it in the box? You can do it in a box. It's just I'm writing big, so I can't okay. quite fit it in there. Uh, square root of 36 is still going to be 6, but this time the center sign is a negative. So it's x minus 6 squared. So I'm looking at 1 times x minus 6 squared plus 0. All right. Next one. Again, the square root of the first and last terms. x and square root of 100 is? 10, carry along the middle sign, still positive, so x plus 10. So when we put it in the appropriate form, we're going to have a 1, x minus the negative 10 squared plus 0. We're getting there. Yeah, it's coming. All right. So the next one, just cut into the chase here, it's going to be x plus 50 squared. So we're looking at 1 times x minus negative 50 squared plus 0. All right. Now, fractional value, there's no reason why that would be any more intimidating as long as it's still a perfect square. We know a fraction is a perfect square if the top of the fraction and the bottom of the fraction are both perfect numbers, perfect squares. All right, so we've got the same deal going on here. No need to make it any more complicated than it needs to be. It's still the same concept. All right, we still have the x. To find the square root, we're just taking the... I just got locked out. Uh, we're taking the square root of each part of the fraction separately. So the square root of 9 is? Three. Square root of 4 is? Two. 2. All right, so we're looking at 1 times x minus 3 halves squared plus 0. Now we're getting to the point where we're going to expand upon this because you look at that last example, x squared plus 8x plus 3 well, 3 is not a perfect square. And unless you want to include radicals, we, we're going to want to make an adjustment here. So in number 12 where it says what's different about the last example in the table, 3 is not a perfect square. All right. So we got to make an adjustment. So it says, how would you change the expression? Well, the short answer is to say, let's make it a perfect square. All right. So that's it's a heck of a 
challenge. How, you know, how, how could I make a three into a perfect square? I mean, I guess I could divide it by three, but that, that would require me to divide everything by three, all right? Um, and it would also require it to be an equation, so that's, that's not gonna work. What I could do is add, I have x squared plus eight x plus three. I can add something to it to make it a perfect square. I can make, I can add a one all right, so I'll do that first. Don't write it down, but I'll, I'll do it and I'll carry out the process. If I add a one to it, what I'm gonna get, because I'm gonna erase this almost immediately. X squared plus eight X plus four would factor to X plus two squared. Does that play out? If I distribute that, will I get an eight X in the middle? No, I'm, I'm gonna get a four X, so that can't work. I mean, it's a, it's a good thought, though, because by adding one, you're telling me, let's get it to the nearest perfect square. It's a good thought. It's, it's not going to get the job done, though. So what should I add to it? If I add 15 to 3, that's going to get me to an 18. You said the wrong number. Then. 13. All right. Now... Can I just add an, add a number to another number and call it equivalent? Nope. No, because if I said, here's the number 9, and you say, oh, I'm just going to add 3 to that, you make it a 12. 12 and 9 are not the same thing. So I have to correct for that. So I'm going to also simultaneously subtract off a, th a 13. And you say, well, what, what was the point then? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine the like terms, assuming my pen wants to work, and get x squared plus 8x plus 16, and then we have the minus 13 off at the end. So here we're factoring by grouping. It's just a different kind of grouping than we were working on before. All right, it's not gonna involve... I got it. You got it? Right. It's not gonna involve GCFs. What we're gonna do is we'll partition it right there, and since this is now a perfect square trinomial, along the lines of the previous questions in the table, this is factorable to something squared. What would that something be? Four. X plus four. Because all we're doing is taking the square root of the first and last terms, just like we were doing before, and carrying down the middle sign. But we still have that 13 tacked on at the end, so that negative 13. So the big question of will it always be plus zero has just been answered. Here's a case where it's not always plus zero. All right. So this is equivalent to one times x minus negative four squared minus 13. All right. Now, I'm going to show you really quickly what this looks like graphically just so you can get a sense and, and just how important these values are. Because we had to correct for adding 13 to keep the expression equivalent to what we started with. Yeah, because if if I could just add a number anytime I want, that that would like just break math. Okay. Um, why did you add a 13 and subtract a 13 instead of adding a 1 and subtracting a 1? Because if we added a 1 and subtracted a 1, we would have gotten x plus 2 squared, which wouldn't have oh. given us the 8 in the middle. All right, let me get my calculator out. All right, I'm just gonna show you really quickly. It's not anything you need to worry about right now, but I, I wanna just show you the relationship. Um, Cause we're gonna do a whole unit on graphing quadratics. And so that, that's something that's naturally gonna work itself out. But I, I, I didn't wanna just leave it like this because you look at it and say, well, how is this any better than that? I want to give you a good reason for why we're doing this. All right, so I'm going to start off with my x squared plus 8x plus 3. And then I'll put in my new expression. That's equivalent. 1 times x minus the negative 4 squared minus 13. All right. 
So in theory, these two things are equivalent. Yeah. So when I go to the table, I see that they're, they are equivalent because they're producing the same y values. That's fine. Astonishing. So we have two equivalent graphs. I mean, you can look at the picture. I mean, mine is because my calculator works a little differently. It looks a little, little kookier. But this is what a parabola looks like. I'm just kind of playing around with the zoom. This should be good enough. What I have here, I'm just trying to get the scale to show up, is a low value, a turning point that appears to be at negative four for the x value, corresponding with a y value that's somewhere in the neighborhood of that negative 15. All right. What we come up with when we put it in the standard form is we come up with the vertex, or also known as the turning point of the graph. These two values give us the turning point of the parabola. All right. Now, since a parabola under normal circumstances leads us to what we call extreme values, maximum and minimum values, but also Contextually, parabolas fit in a lot of real life uh, situations. If you can fit the graph of a parabola to a real data set, then what you would end up with is a way in which you can determine maximum and minimum values. The simplest example is projectile motion. If I take an object, throw it up in the air, it's gonna follow a parabolic arc. Right? So just by knowing the characteristics of the graph, I can determine how high the, the parabola would go. But I, I can't imagine that anybody sitting at a free throw line playing basketball thinking to themselves, all right, I wonder what the, what the turning point of this parabola is going to be and then they take the shot. I, I don't think that makes sense. But you would have to have an intuitive feel for how high the ball is going to go. I mean, when we do the basketball activity in this class, we, we're, going to shoot, we're going to shoot the ball towards the basket. You don't need to mathematically figure out high, how high the ball is going to go in order to know that it can't go too high, otherwise you're going to hit the ceiling. Yeah. Right? So that's where the common sense and the feel for the, the actual act of shooting a basketball is going to come into play. But we will also evaluate the mathematics behind it because it's pretty interesting. All right. We also had, well, I don't need my calculator anymore. We also have the geometric way of completing the square. That's really talking about physically completing a square. All right? So you see the dotted lines. That's the square that we're trying to complete based off of the given information. This is a direct consequence of the activity that we were working on on Friday. All right? So all we're asked to do here is come up with the geometric figures that would complete this square. Knowing that I'm going to have a square with an area of x squared and four rectangles that have a total area of 4x. All right. So each one of them has to be worth x. Now, there's a lot of intuition that you could use to come up with the solution to this without articulating every single thought. That's more for like next year. In geometry, you'll have to articulate every single thought. All right. Here, you can kind of just use your sense of the situation to determine what's reasonable. but if you really think about it, you're talking about a square. All sides are congruent in the square. If that square is going to have an area of x squared, each, each dimension should be what? X. x. All right. We also know that opposite sides of a rectangle and a square are congruent to one another. All right. So that means that this side's x, this side is x. And when I create this rectangle here, it's going to have a side length of x. All right. Now, if its area has to be x and one dimension is also x, what must the second dimension be? A well, 1, because 1 times x is equal to x. So I now know the length of these two sides. 
All right. So if I wanted to, and I do, I could figure out the overall length of the square x plus 2 more, right? So x plus 2. All right, now we can physically complete the square. I'm going to use more rectangles. Just use my line draw tool. Yeah. A little bit bigger. I'll just do it again because I forgot how to copy paste on this. All right. So I have two more rectangles, each with an area of, an, of x, each with dimensions 1 by x. Now if I want to complete the square here, I can do it with single unit values. All right. And there would be a total of four of them. All right. But... A natural consequence of this is that each of these sides would have a length of x plus 2. But we already knew that because if it's going to be a square, once I figure out one side is x plus 2, then the other one also has to be x plus 2. All right. So we're getting from this the, the relationship x squared plus 4x plus 4 would be the same as x plus 2 squared. So the whole point behind these kind of problems is to de develop, really, the geometric intuition. Because, right? you know, I have that sign up on the back wall, the calculus intuition. It, it's really not just limited to calculus. It was just relevant in that class. The analytic, that's the algebra. The graphical is the visual. Logical is where we tie it all together. So between these two ideas, what we were doing on the previous page in this you get a better picture, a better understanding of the concept. All right. So number two is along the same lines. I wanted to do something a little juicier. So let's, let's take a look at number three. I'm going to draw a square. We'll get started with a square that has dimensions x by x. That accounts for the x squared. All right. So that's, that's priority number one. All right, as long as all four sides look congruent, roughly, you're going to be in good shape. A ruler can be helpful just to kind of get the measurements down. I'm going to do it like that. Now, this is telling me right here, this is telling me how many rectangles I need to have. So I'm going to have a total of eight split evenly among the two sides. So I'm going to draw... Two rectangles. I'll, use, I'll do it differently this time, though. And then I'll just draw a line down the middle. Kind of. Looks not too terrible. You get the idea. Get in there. Block in. All right, let me just look. Kind of. All right. Oh, we need four on each side. Sorry. Split the difference. There we go. undo. I'm just going to have to live with that one being a little weird. But the labeling x squared, we're going to have four x's here, four x's here. Now, if I, I'm just going to rough it out, create the grid. Exactly, we're going to have 16 of them. All right. 
So that's going to be 4 by 4. So 16 one unit boxes. All right. Now, that's telling me what my target number should be. All right. So I'm aiming for 16. Now, we've already done this problem. Bless you. We've already done this problem. So previously, it was like, all right, do we add one? No. Why? Because I tried it and it didn't work. Here, it's more like, well, what do we need in order to complete that square physically? Now, this is the, this is the nice part. We already have three single units. So we already have three of these accounted for. So now we're really just asking ourselves, how many more do I need in order to get where I need to go? All right, so that's, we had x squared plus eight x plus three. In order to get to that target number of 16, I now know visually that I need to add 13 more to get there, all right? All right. But again, in order to not completely violate the rules of math, I can't just add 13 without subtracting it. it. Allows us to combine our terms here, giving us an x plus, well, I won't skip the step, x squared plus 8x plus 16 minus the 13. Bless you. So x plus 4 squared minus 13. And then, you know, depending on the question, if you needed to put it in a particular form, you could. But what we have here, and this is the, this is the beauty of it, this part, the x plus 4 squared, that is the completed square in factored form. We are completing the square physically by drawing all these line segments, but we're completing the square algebraically by adding the 13, all right? So this is the just this piece, just this guy here, is the completed square in factored form. All right, completed square in factor form. And that's the ultimate goal, to be able to come up with those kinds of values. All right, so just think about today's class. We got five minutes left. Very, very rare that I talk and instruct for 35 out of the 40 minutes. First period, I went bell to bell, you know. What does that tell you? Uh, a couple of things. But the one that's coming to my mind is that this is such an important concept that it warranted a day where you try to discover it on your own and another day where we debrief on it and put it all together. All right. This is a foundational topic. Factoring, completing the square, simplifying radicals. Those are your foundational topics moving forward. They're never going away. You're always going to need to know these things. All right. So definitely take the time and try to understand this. That's why I left you a couple of examples. So your homework, classwork homework, well, not much class time, but uh, pages 31 to 33. We're going to go over it together. But if you want to take a crack at some of these uh, problems that we skipped on page, whatever this one is, 30, that wouldn't be the worst idea in the world either.